And if you take your Bibles this morning and turn with me, if you will, please, to Philippians chapter 3. I want to just uh, emphasize there is a sign-up sheet for those that want to attend the Lucky for Life groups on Wednesday nights. And uh, if you would sign up, that helps us to be able to have adequate uh, materials here for you. Also, I want to uh, let you know that uh, on the 24th, Saturday night of uh, this month, just in a couple of weeks, we're going to be having a worship and prayer encounter here at 7 o'clock. It will take on kind of the flavor that we did in the um, Good Friday service last spring. Uh, the purpose of it is to kind of bring us together uh, once a month or so uh, and just pray for the needs of the church, to pray for things, uh, to worship God, to be a, uh, to be a special time. And uh, if you can make it, I think you'll enjoy it. So. Philippians chapter 3, I want to uh, read the first 11 verses is what we covered uh, last week. But let's read them again, keeping things in context. Finding my brethren rejoice in the Lord, and for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is said. Beware of dogs, and beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. But indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to your word this morning, we thank you for the truth. Thank you for the principles we looked at and learned last week. And now as we press forward into this chapter, Lord, we thank you for the depths and riches to be revealed to us that we would be able to understand and apply them to our lives. We thank you for the rich heritage we have. We thank you for the truth that we are nailed to. We thank you, Lord, for the cross that has saved us. And we thank you, Lord, for eternal life that we have laid hold of and all the rewards that go with it, Father. Thank you that we are a church that's pressing on, pressing forward, moving individually and as a church, trusting in you and you alone as we go forward in our walk with you. Ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 12 now. The Apostle Paul says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There was no illusion of perfection in the Apostle Paul. He had not attained that. He made that very clear. He struggled with his flesh. It's recorded for us in chapter 7 how he dealt with that and how it was uh, something that, that plagued him. But while the work of Christ for us is perfect, that is, the work that Jesus did on the cross is perfect, we have been given righteousness 
imputed to us because of what Jesus did for that's perfect. We are redeemed from the curse of the law. That's perfect, that's done, that's attained, it's already done. So what Jesus did for us is complete. As on the cross, why he said, it is finished, his work. But the work of the Holy Spirit picked up on the day of Pentecost that works in all of our lives, and that work is an ongoing work. It's an ongoing process. If we try to add anything to what Christ did on the cross, it's worthless. We cannot ever work our way in. We can't ever make atonement for our own sins. But the work of the Holy Spirit of sanctifying us does require of us certain things. The work of the Holy Spirit in us is not perfected or completed yet. And it is continually carried on from day to day and we will need to be continued throughout our whole lives, Charles Spurgeon said. The Apostle Paul said this, he said, I'm not perfect, I'm not attained, but I press on. This is like um, what Jesus talked about in the parable of the, the, the man who, who put his hand to the plow but looked back. And as he was plowing, as he looked back, he got off course. If we're looking back with regret and letting that continually control our lives, we're not going to be pressing forward in a, in a, in a, a, a manner that's going to move us forward in God. If we have uh, uh, looked back with unforgiveness and anger at things in the past and we continually hold that, it hinders our walk with God. So the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, forget them, they're over with, we're moving forward. He said, I press that I may lay hold. Pressing toward the mark results in us laying hold of the things that Jesus purpose for us when he saved us. That Greek word, lay hold, that, that concept there, really is kind of like a picture of a, a football player trying to and tackling his opponent that's got the, the ball, the running back. He grabs a hold of it, says, he, he hits him hard and it, he grabs a hold of it. That's how we are to come to the things of God. When we learn that God has things for us in his word, that doesn't mean that we're automatically going to get them. We have to express our faith. We have to trust. We have to press toward those things. We have to want those things, desire those things in our lives. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying. He's talking about enthusiasm here as he moves forward. He mentioned in these verses prize, the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus. Paul was focused on one thing and would not let those things which are behind distract him from the high calling in Christ Jesus. Paul knew. He wrote these words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He said, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now, those words tell us that he knows his death is impending. His life is about over. And he says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. There is a day when Jesus is going to come back into the clouds. The Bible clearly says that. Now there are those who explain that away. They say, oh, it's just a myth. It's just kind of this and that. No, it, it, it's real. The Bible's not lying. It's either true or it's a lie. And it's not a lie. It's true. Jesus is coming back to this earth. And on that day, everyone's going to see him. All the people are going to see him at the same time as appearing. And we're all going to be given the crown of righteousness. That's what Paul is saying. With all of us that have pressed on. He said, I press toward the goal. He understood. And described to us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, there's a crown of glory that fades not away. 
That's something that we press for. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 talks about the crown of life. Those are things that we get as we press on and we continue to follow God. Now, I submit to you that it's because we press, not because we're perfect, that we please God and secure rewards in heaven. No one is going to get perfect this side of heaven, but all can be perfect as we press on in God. Verses 15 and 16, we we'll break it down slowly. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Wait a minute. He just said he wasn't. He said, I'm not attained. I'm not perfect. I'm not complete. Now he says, as many of us as are mature. How can that be? This is how, how David lived, I believe. Okay? David, in a sense, if you read his life story in the scriptures, you'll find that he was pretty much an epic failure. I mean, he sinned big time. I'm not even going to name his sins because most of you know him already. I don't care about it, but he had a lot of things he did wrong, many of them. But he was known as a man after God's so God called to that, a man after my own heart. Why? Because David repented when he fell. He didn't continue in sin. He made a mistake, did something wrong. He repented, he was sorry. He called out to God and he pressed on. I believe that it's not in the perfection, it's in the pressing forward. That God deems us as being perfect, even though we're not, when we press on. It goes on and says that, and if anything, if any, and if any, if anything, you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Now Paul had complete confidence in the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to the ones who press on. That's a wonderful thing to understand. We all face trials, we all face things, painful experiences, sometimes physical, sometimes emotional, sometimes spiritual, things that we don't want to face and they hurt us and we retract a little and we, 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 we we're impacted by that in such a way and we question why do I have to go through this? This doesn't make any sense. This is terrible and I have to go through this. Paul gives us a pattern here. If we press on, if we continue to serve Jesus, eventually we will understand more about that situation and be able to deal with it. Does that make sense? He says, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Now this is a call to the pressers or the kingdom seekers to be in unity, knowing that we are perfected as we press on in faith. Love, forgiveness, all the power of the Holy Spirit is availed to us as we continue to press on. There's so many people who have started their walk with God and have come to some kind of an impact, something they didn't understand, or someone hurt them, or they sinned something so bad they can't forgive themselves, and so they, they just continue in sin instead of continuing pressing on. Verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Follow my example. Note those who so walk. 
This is why church and fellowship of the believers is so important. This is why we need to be around others. This is why we need to be able to, to be rubbing shoulders with the elders and pastors and, and, and why we need to be encouraging one another. We need to be learning from one another. Somebody faces a difficult time and, and, and we watch their life and we say, okay, are they going to make it? How are they going to handle this situation? And when they come through and they stand strong in God, it speaks to our hearts, it encourages us. And that's what Paul is saying. This is why church is so important, so necessary for us to be together, to rub shoulders, to be able to fellowship with one another, to be able to learn from one another, to see others go through the difficult times and make it. There are people in this fellowship that have been through difficult times, terrible times. There's people in this room today that have went through undeserved things and have gotten through difficult times and they're, and they're here. And they're pressing on. And that speaks volumes to the rest of us. Paul also said in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, verse 1, he said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Be like Christ. Be an imitator of Jesus. Be a forgiver. Be one who speaks truth. Be one who cares about others. Verse 18 and 19. The sad news now. For many walk, of whom I have told you often. So let me just stop there and say, all repeated himself, okay? Good preachers, good pastors repeat themselves, okay? Because we learn by repetition, and oftentimes there's people in the service that didn't hear it the last time. So you'll hear things from time to time, you'll hear the same things from time to time. Don't get frustrated with that. It's all part of the learning process. He said, I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping. So he's emotional about what he's going to say here. Something has touched his heart deeply. That they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Many, he says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. He wept over the unrepentant sinners and their lives because he knew they really weren't saved. They were not pressing on. They were just deceived. He says, for many are enemies of the cross. When we say that men are enemies of the cross, we mean that, that they are enemies of the biblical truth of the atonement that Jesus made for us on the cross and his ongoing power and effect in our life enemies of that. How could anyone be an enemy of that? What would be in people that were hanging around the church in those days that they were enemies of the cross? He says now, whose end is destruction, that word destruction is the same word used for perdition in other places of the scriptures. It refers to the ultimate damnation and the present destruction of their lives in the here and now. I, uh, I'm concerned about the culture we live in and even the Christian culture sometimes, you know. <coughs> That people that don't have any real evidence of ever really serving God suddenly pass away and all of a sudden on Facebook everyone is rest in peace, you know. Well, you know, what is this rest in peace stuff anyway? <laughs> We're not going to be resting. In eternity, God has things for us to do. We're going to be active and we're going to be ruling and reigning with him. We're not going to be up there sleeping on some cloud. Rest, don't, I don't, don't put that on my thing, man. I don't want that on my tombstone. 
I did not plan to rest at all. He said, I'm going to be ruling and reigning with you. I'm going to be busy. There's things to do. I'm going to be bored resting for eternity. But this is the mentality out there that they just rest in peace. Rest in peace. No. Many people may say that about her in hell. They're not resting in peace. They're going to be spending eternity in hell because they have denied, neglected, or rejected the only way that they could be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ. And for us to, to just chime in and say, oh, well, just rest in peace, you know, it's a wonderful thing, he's a great guy, you know. Be careful what we say. Paul made it clear. Their end is destruction. Their lives in the present, here and now, are, are, are experiencing damnation. He says, whose God is their belly. This describes the idolatry of these enemies. Not that they were necessarily focused on what they eat, but the belly here has a broader reference to the sensual indulgence in general. They live only for sensual pleasures. God created sensual pleasure, and it is, it is a place for that. God designed our bodies with all of the feelings and emotions and things that we experience. He designed the marriage bed to be between a man and a woman for life, marriage, a place where sensual pleasure can be enjoyed. He says, whose glory is in their shame. That their, their shameful deeds, they glory in those things. Boy, is this culture good at that? Are we seeing evil presented in a way that they're just, you know, glorifying it? Well, we're there. We're at that place. Who set their mind on earthly things. This is where their focus is. It's all here. It's all what I can get out of this life. Now, understand that God has given us things to enjoy. He's not against us enjoying life and enjoying proper things. But that's not what it's all about. We need to have our focus on him. We need to be pressing toward the high calling that Christ has on our lives. It was not to, the, the, these people he's speaking of, they didn't care about worshiping God, but to get a much, as much pleasure out of life as they could. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven. William Barclay, in his great commentary on this, says this. Paul is saying, just as the Roman colonists never forgot that they belonged to Rome, we must never forget that we are citizens of heaven and our conduct must match our citizenship. We have a higher calling than, than the citizenship of the United States even. We're citizens of heaven. Verse 21 speaks of the future work of the Savior and is transforming our bodies. It says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body? according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. When we're resurrected, we will have the same type of body that Jesus himself has right now, a glorified body. It won't be anything like this. It will never suffer pain again. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be like, but it's going to be a good body. Eternal body. To be able to do things that we can't do in this body. Verse 
First Corinthians chapter 13 talks about those days when we will be with him. And it says, for we will be made perfect and complete. And we will know him just like he knows us. Talk about the light bulb coming on. Wow. In a twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15 says, we will be caught up into his presence and we will be able to understand him in ways we have never been able to now. I was talking with my brother the other day and he's facing some very serious health issues and, uh, and it, it, it doesn't really look good for him. Um, and so we were talking and, and uh, he came to know the Lord also right here at this church a few weeks after I did. And he served the Lord. He loves the Lord. Oh, I've never seen anybody that just had pure faith like him. And we got talking about what's ahead for him. Maybe. And we both realized that for over 44 years now, 46 years, that we have served Jesus by faith. Everything we did, we've done by faith. We've never seen him. He spoke to our spirit at times, and he's encouraged us by his spirit and all those kinds of things. But it's always been that way. But someday, face to face, we're going to walk with him. I don't know about you. The older I get, that sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who will transform our lowly bodies that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. How is he going to do this? By his mighty power. His mighty power is able to subdue everything. Those that are antagonistic against God, those who hate Jesus, those who hate us Christians, they're going to be subdued. Their days come. Their knee will bow. They will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's also able to subdue things in our lives. Sinful patterns that we can't seem to get out of, we're locked into, and we just fall back, and every once in a while we do this, and I can't believe I was so free from that. For, and then I went back, and I, you know, listen, Jesus is the one who can subdue that sinful pattern in our lives and bring it into subjection. We trust him to do it. We, we, we can try on our own and we can make some headway perhaps, but we never make it all the way. But if we submit it to him, he will find a way. Jesus loves it when we cry out to him and say, Lord, help me. I'm tired of this sin. I'm tired of this anger I have or this unforgiveness I have or this, this lust that I have. Whatever it is, he wants to help us so that we can walk better. That's part of the pressing on In 1982, I had a guest speaker come into our church for a weekend. He was from, he was a street preacher who preached on uh, Sunset Strip in Los Angeles, California. He was a pretty amazing guy. I don't remember what he talked about, but I remember the illustration that he shared. He said the Christian life, and he was talking about pressing on, is like riding a bicycle. You're either on and pedaling, or you're off. You know, you're not going anywhere unless you're pedaling. Christian life is like that. We have to be moving forward. We have to be pressing out. We have to be pedaling the bike to get to keep moving forward. At the same time, we need to realize, and I love this little illustration. There were two men walking through an apple orchard, and it was June, early summer. And it was an orchard of red, delicious apples. And the two men as they were walking through, one of the men reached up and grabbed an apple from the tree and pulled it down. And being only June, it was green and hard and 
And, and he looked at the, his friend and he said, now there's a perfect apple. And so what do you mean a perfect apple? He said that thing's green, it's supposed to be red, it, 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 it's, it's hard, it's supposed to be soft and juicy. If you were to bite into it, it would be sour. It's supposed to be sweet. He said, yes, but it's perfect for the stage of development it's at. If we're pressing on, you and I are perfect for the stage of development we're at. Don't beat yourself up, just continue to press on. Don't get hung up on the past, forgetting those things that are behind, press on. Just press on. As you do, you're perfect in this sight. Father, thank you this morning for your word as we prepare our hearts for communion. We thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I want to read to us a passage of the scripture. As we prepare, as we prepare our hearts, I'd like to ask the elders to come and Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as many as you, as, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He's coming back. And by taking communion, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. We're, we're, we're expressing that we believe in what he did for us. Verse 27 says, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In other words, don't take this casually. <laughs> if there's sin in your heart, just ask the Lord to forgive you. Clean it up. He's quick to forgive us our sins. Don't worry about that. Just get it cleaned up and do it now before you take communion. Verse 28, he says, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many have died. For if we, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned. With the world. Lord Jesus, we want to discern, understand, appreciate right now what you've done for us. Church, I want to give you just an opportunity in your heart, just, just ask the Lord to give him. And right now, just thank him for what he did for you personally. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, do that right now. We do that by acknowledging that we're sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We acknowledge that our sin separates us from God, for the wages of sin is death, separation from God. But the, the gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ alone. We receive that. We receive him into our hearts and our lives, making him Lord and Savior of our lives. And we're not ashamed of him. We confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we are saved. Thank you, Lord. 
But we must receive all of that. Receive him into our lives. For John 1, 12 says, For as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God. Receive him as your king, as your Lord, and as your Savior. Tell him that right now. I'm going to ask that we prepare to take communion this morning and to ask our elders to be ready to serve us. As we come down the aisles here, we will be ready for you. Um, why don't we all stand and let's, uh, let's sing our last song together.